Hello, all you virtual learners. Okay, so here we go. After the Civil War, there was definitely a need for a new South because they had zero industry leading up to the Civil War. They didn't have factories, they didn't have railroads, they had jack squat. So they gotta, they gotta develop those things. And um, write this down because it's on your worksheet and I always forget to put his name on here. Henry Grady, he is the guy that talked about developing a new South, okay? He is the one that always talked about it, saying we have to build up the Southern economy, not just with agriculture, but with industry as well, okay? Now, textile factories. Does anybody have an idea what a textile factory actually is? Yeah, you know, all the, the fabric that they make your clothes and stuff with, you can't grow fabric you've got to make it. So they take the materials that are used to make fabric and that's, that's how they do it, okay? I, I don't know how they do it, but that's where they do it. Now, a lot of these textile factories are going to go in in North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. And honestly, it makes sense that the South has textile factories because they produce so much cotton, okay? I mean, what else are you gonna do with cotton? We've already talked before, you sure as heck ain't gonna eat it unless you're a psycho, okay? But other industries that are going to become important, and these are mostly gonna be in the Western United States, coal, iron, steel, because that's where all of those resources are. A lot of them are in the West. And so we're gonna to have to start having ways to process those things. Because if you're gonna build a building, you can't just have somebody hand you a big chunk of steel. What are you gonna do with that? Somebody's got to make it into a beam or, you know, something that you use to build a building with, whatever that is. When it comes to our home repairs, I can paint the heck out of anything, but, you know, doing the hardware and all that kind of stuff, no bueno. Okay, you should see my kitchen cabinets. I put new hardware on all of them. My husband had to take it out and put, like, this glue stuff in there and then redo them because it was embarrassing. It was like... I took a picture of it. I was so proud. Oh, we're recording. And instead of my handle being this way, it's like that way. And I thought, oh, nobody will notice. And I sent my dad a picture and he's like, what's wrong with your handles on your cabinet? And I was like, dang it. I did that on purpose. I should have. Or I should have said the kids messed with it after I glued it in. And he's like, you don't glue in your hardware. Like, dang it, you're right. Anyhow, but... Um, a lot of these coal, iron, and steel processing centers, they did get built in Nashville, Tennessee, and Birmingham, Alabama. So uh, over in this area, because they do have quite a bit of coal in that region. And farming becomes more diversified. I told you that before, but cotton is still king. That is the number one cash crop. A cash crop is something that you sell to make money. That is the sole purpose of growing it. Not because you can eat it, so you can sell it for money. Okay. And smaller farms start to replace large translation, tra large plantations. This is not the times of slavery anymore. You don't have 50 to 100 slaves to work your fields. So you may not be able to afford the labor to work that much land. So you sell off part of your farm. Okay. Transportation. And I said, Henry Grady said, we need industrialization. Well, if we don't have transportation to get those goods and services from place to place, uh, all those factories are worthless. We need a railroad, okay? We're gonna get one, okay? The Southern rail lines start to expand. During the Civil War, they had like zero railroads. I mean, they had some, but not very many. So now they're gonna start building those. So, you know, a little podunk farmer over here can get their cotton into the big city, okay? More rural to urban lines. And I wish that we had like a train in Lindsay that would just take you to Norman. That way I could like read a book or something on my way to go grocery shopping or, you know, I could do something like that instead of having to drive. I hate driving. But anyhow, rural to urban lines. And prison labor is what is going to actually help build the railroads. We don't have slaves anymore. So let's use the prisoners. Let's put them to work. They built a lot of the Southern railroads in our country. And uh, we're going to find that many Southerners are going to lobby the federal government for aid. Does anybody know what it means when you say they lobby them? 
Well, they don't take money away from them. They give money to them, so they take give them bribes. But that's a different story. Um, lobbying is basically the people who go to Capitol Hill and they're like, hey, we need you uh, to do this to help us. We need you to do that to help us. And so they're basically begging Congress we need you to give us money to build the railroads. And if you do that, you know, maybe we'll give you a kickback, which is illegal, but, I, you know, it happened. Um, and because of this, we start to develop new cities. How many people in here have seen the movie Cars? It's a cartoon. Okay, now Radiator Springs, it was a booming town. And then the interstate got built. The interstate did not go along Radiator Springs. It bypassed it. So Radiator Springs turned into a ghost town. But then new cities are gonna pop up along the interstate. That's what happens with the railroads. If your town gets bypassed by the railroad, you're gonna disappear. But if you build a city on the railroad, it's gonna boom, okay? Um, let me give you two more examples. Stillwater and Norman. They are both big college towns here in Oklahoma. Stillwater is a smaller town. It's located 20 miles off the interstate. Norman is on the interstate. There's a lot more stuff there. Same way with railroads. So some of the cities that are going to develop because of the railroad, Dallas, Atlanta, Nashville, these are still major cities today. So, I mean, that gives you just some idea of how big of an impact the railroad actually had on the development of the United States. But what's interesting is there were only two rail lines that linked southern freight to northern markets. So that meant, yeah, we might have a bunch of little railroads, but all of those railroads had to lead to two places. And if you wanted to go north, you had to get to one of those two places. Basically like, you know, in Oklahoma City, we have Will Rogers World Airport. You cannot fly anywhere in the world from Oklahoma City. If you wanna fly anywhere in the world, you go to Dallas, you go to Chicago, you go to Atlanta, okay? About the only place you can go from Oklahoma City is just those big city hubs. They're not gonna send you overseas from Oklahoma City. It's not gonna happen. Okay, now the Southern economy, it sucks. There's no other way to say it, it sucks. Um, it lags behind the rest of the country, why? Yeah, they don't have all their industrial stuff. The Civil War destroyed them, and it's going to take a lot of time to rebuild that, okay? And, you know, to build up that industry, which we need, industry thrives on a handful of things. First of all, you need natural resources, okay? You have to have natural resources. And, you know, some places just didn't have them. Okay, you can't go, oh, hey, I'm just going to go over to Paul's Valley. I'm going to start digging and I'm going to find me some oil. Okay, it, it doesn't work that way. Like every place doesn't have all those natural resources. But that's one thing you have to have in order to have industry. You also need labor. Okay, so you're going to find the labor in the cities. That's why so many people move to the cities. And education was limited and the workers were not trained. And I think we talked about that in the last chapter. There were tons of people that got injured on the job and it was because they didn't train their employees because they were like, eh, if you get your arm cut off, we'll just hire somebody else, okay? And in the South, they didn't have the money to send people to go get trained. Like if you're gonna be an auto mechanic, you go and you learn how to do that. Okay, well in the South, let's say your car breaks down. At the time, they didn't have money to send people to go get trained to do that. So I may have to take my car to Kelby and she may have to fix my radiator. Kelby, do you know how to do that? Heck no, neither do I. But Kelby's like, well, it's my job, so I'm gonna try and do it. Well, that may not work out so well. That's what's going on in the South right now. And low wages prevent workers from coming to the South because in the South, they have no money. So they can't pay people very much. Okay, if I have the choice of a job in the South that pays 10 bucks an hour and one in the North that pays 20, I'm gonna go live in the North. Even though it's cold and they talk funny, I'm gonna go live in the North. An investment, put a star next to this. This is a huge problem. During the Civil War, most of the Southern banks failed. 
okay? Few Southern banks survived the war. Well, let's say you wanna start a business. Okay, I don't know about you guys, but I don't have tens of thousands of dollars laying around if I wanna go start a business. Chances are, I'm gonna to have to go get a loan. Where do you go to get loans? The bank. There's not very many banks in the South. They all closed. So if there's no place to get a loan, you can't create and start a business. So that really, really hurt. The banks are gonna be what you need to know. And the wealth is very concentrated. It's the same story as before the war. There were a handful of people that were rich. There's still a handful of people that are rich and then there's everybody else. All us peons, us average Joes. Okay, and prior to the Civil War, cotton and tobacco were the cash crops. I told you guys, that'll be on your worksheet. Cash crop means you just sell it for cash because you're not gonna go out into the field, pick your tobacco and just eat it and swallow it. I hope not, that's gonna make you sick, okay? But they grew these cash crops. One of the problems it is hard to diversify. If you're making money off of selling cotton, you're probably gonna to wanna to keep doing that. But the economy needed more diversity in our crops and the farmers were not giving it to us. And cotton, again, becomes the centerpiece of Southern agriculture, even though they did diversify a little bit. But things are gonna get bad the price of cotton is going to drop extremely low. And I'm gonna use my book on here so I can give you an idea. In 1865, when the war ended, cotton sold for 80 cents per pound. In 1890, the time we're talking about here, cotton was about nine cents per pound. That's a big drop, okay? And the reason why, we used to supply Europe with their cotton. While we were having that whole Civil War thing that lasted about four years, they were like, shoot, we'll go get cotton someplace else. We can figure it out. And the South is like, no, take my cotton. And Europe is like, eh, I'll pass. So we had too much cotton, which drives prices down. Too much. And then the boll weevil this ugly, nasty looking bug right there, the dreaded boll weevil. Now, this thing struck the South with force. Um, the boll weevil, it's a beetle. It could destroy an entire crop of cotton and it appeared in Texas in the 1890s. Um, over the next decade, the yield from cotton cultivation in some states dropped by 50%. That thing ate half of their crops, ate it, okay? So, I mean, that's not good because the farmers, yeah, prices are low and maybe that'll help demand go up. But at the same time, if you pay to plant all of this cotton and then half of it gets destroyed, you're gonna lose money, okay? Oh, I didn't even need my book, it's on the PowerPoint. So anyhow, Cotton production drops by 50% in some states. Texas was hit hard, very, very hard. And I don't know if you guys have ever driven through a state that raises cotton. Like my family lives in West Texas, so we drive through there. And when the cotton is ready to be harvested and you look out um, through all the pastures, it looks like there's snow everywhere. Blankets of snow for miles and miles. It's really kind of pretty. So the Texas farmers, because the stupid boll weevil is ruining their lives, they decide, you know what? Let's get together and let's do something. Let's crush all the boll weevils. Well, they couldn't do that. So they decide what we can do is we can try and negotiate people for lower prices on our supplies. You know, our machinery that we use, our seeds that we plant, let's try and get lower prices for those. And these organizations, they all link together. So you might have um, in each of these little towns in Texas, they would have an organization and then they all came together as a whole to negotiate. Which leads us to discuss the Farmers Alliance. Okay, Farmers Alliance will be on your worksheet. It will be on your test. 
Um, it linked far farmers in the South and the West. Like I just said, they had a bunch of little local organizations that all came together. They also tried to work to lower freight rates. Um, what that means is, you know, if you get your cotton to the railroad and you try and ship it to a textile factory, they charge you per pound to transport that cotton. And so they're like, let's try and negotiate for them to charge us less so we might have a chance to make more money. And they tried to get interest rates regulated. So when they're taking out loans, um, they don't have to pay as much back because when the interest rates are high, that's why I don't own a van right now. Because I tried to go buy me a new van and they were gonna give me like an 8% interest rate. I have great credit, I'm not paying an 8% interest rate. So that's why I drive like a suburban thing now because I got like a 3% interest rate on it. One day I will own a van, mark my words. Excuse me, teachers, can I see the following students in the Leopard Den? Gage Tucker, Addison Rice, Alejandra Hernandez, Hayden Rouse, Emily Stone, Austin Hines, Emily Araceo. Thank you. I bet those are the students of the month. Cool beans. Okay, anyhow, so political and economic gains, and we're mostly talking about, about black southern farmers right now. Um, I guess they're not all farmers, but... Many opened urban businesses, and then some of them bought farmland, okay? If you open an urban business, that means you move to the city. Maybe you have a grocery store, who knows? Um, and in places where they didn't have black codes forbidding it, they did buy land. They could serve in the military. They could serve in the government, as long as the KKK didn't get involved, which they did. And many of them joined the Farmers Alliance. That was the cool thing about the Farmers Alliance. They are like... We don't care if you're white, black, orange, purple, blue. Come on, y'all. We all got to beat the boll weevil together. Boll weevils don't discriminate. They'll eat anybody's cotton. Okay? And education became so important because if you learn how to read and write and you become an educated person, you can advocate for yourself. You can fight for yourself. You can learn the laws and, you know, all that kind of stuff. To, to improve your life. And a lot of these black Southerners are starting to be able to do that. But of course, there's some white backlash because people, this makes me mad. Like, you know what? Let's say Morgan and I both want to be student of the month and Morgan gets it. Instead of me being hateful and resentful that she got it instead of me, I ought to be like, well done, Morgan. I'm proud of you. Like, celebrate other people's successes. Get excited about it. You know, that's a big deal for Morgan. Okay? My time will come. And if it doesn't, pfft, trust me, in 20 years, nobody's going to care if you were student of the month. I don't know if I ever got student of the month. Maybe I did. I don't know. Honestly, couldn't tell you. Okay? But that's how these some of these white people were. They were like, black people are getting to vote. They're getting to read. We can't have that. Like, that's not right. So they get upset and they get butt hurt. So the Ku Klux Klan, racist buttholes, they start using violence and terror to try and take away these gains that these black people have worked hard for. Okay? Um, churches become segregated. And I'm just thinking, y'all, Jesus doesn't care what you look like. He loves everybody. But people are like, oh, no, no, no. I can't sit in the same church as a black person. I'm like, well, that makes you racist, but... That's your prerogative, I suppose. So in 1875, we are going to have the passage of the Civil Rights Act. And it's going to say blacks can use public facilities and accommodations. Okay, they can. You can't deny them from using those public facilities. But do you think the South will find ways to deny them? Yeah, they will. Okay, and the Supreme Court says, hey, it's not a federal government issue. It's a... It's left up to the state and local governments. It's up to the state and local governments to determine and make sure that blacks are able to use all facilities and accommodations. And state of Alabama, how do you think they're gonna feel about that? They're not gonna them. Yeah, they're not gonna treat them right. Cause at the time, racist buttholes. And I'm not calling everybody a racist butthole because 
you know, that's kind of one of those things. One bad apple can ruin it for everybody, okay? But don't be a racist butthole. So it's determined by each state. So the Civil Rights Act of 1875 was not nearly as effective as it should have been.